Well, hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Join me, Sam Harris, on my journey of curiosity and growth. I have conversations with some of the world's most fascinating humans, from billionaires to Olympians, and most everyone in between, such as suspiciously happy people and even a hitman. Success isn't just for successful people, it is earned and you can earn it too. I find out how ordinary people become extraordinary to fuel your own growth mindset. Welcome to the show. Today I'm interviewing Peaches Golding, the Lord Lieutenant of Bristol. She is first and foremostly a truly incredible lady who's done some brilliant things with her life, which led to her becoming a Lord Lieutenant, which is a pretty awesome thing to be doing. I did speak to her earlier this week on the podcast, where Peaches gave us a short masterclass on what the prestigious titles in Britain mean, like Sir and Dame, and how you might get one and how to write letters to the Queen. And that was a very inspiring lesson in basically doing everything that you can to be an awesome human. Now, in this episode, we dive deeper into Peach's own life, from childhood to leading ambitious businesses and her work in solving racial inequality. As the overseer of Bristol, she is involved in planning and facilitating what goes on in the city over the next 10 years. And it was really fascinating to hear from her about the effects of rioters tearing down the Colston statue, the coronavirus, and just the big shifts that will be happening at a societal level over the future. A very insightful podcast on humans and equality, and also trying to shift the world to a better future. So it's my delight to talk to Peaches, and I'm sure you will enjoy this episode. I like talking to people about the future and what they kind of think is going on in their area of expertise in the next sort of five to ten years. I think we do have some serious opportunities out there and I look at them as opportunities rather than challenges because I think that puts you in a better frame of mind. How do we best handle climate change and sustainability? And I think that's very exciting because I think COVID has taught us a number of things about, guess what, it's okay to ride a bicycle. Riding a bicycle to work is maybe a good idea and a bicycle to see your friends and things. It cuts down on transportation emissions, you know, it improves your fitness levels. So I think COVID is teaching us a lot about how we might be able to handle climate change. I think it's taught businesses how they can pivot very quickly on their axis and do things differently. You know, a lot of the imagination was, gosh, can we cope? And yes, we had people coming out and saying, well, we can make scrubs for the NHS or we can make hand sanitizers or we can make ventilators or we can do all sorts of interesting things. And I think that we've learned a lot in these past few months Mm -hmm. about how we can be more sustainable. A lot more people have gardens, even if it's just on their windowsill. I totally agree with the whole COVID changing people's mindsets things and obviously I've been a big advocate of like cycling around everywhere since uh, back when I was at uni and doing that all the time but yeah it does seem like just sort of breaking down the barriers that are in people's brains of what can like happen because if you think about like a country just locking down or something you didn't even imagine that happening and it's just like oh the world can really shift if we decide to and we can be a green economy quite easily by just choosing to be hypothetically speaking it's just what people do each day so yeah, it just open up the potential that these things can really happen just based on like what we do with our lives. I, I think some yeah. of the exciting things are if you look at the UK's energy production, all of our energy is coming from renewable sources. So that's those great wind turbines you see or marine turbines, a bit of nuclear, yeah. of course. But yeah, that is significant. And investment of that sort is really what we ought to be thinking about to decarbonize mm. our energy sources. Do you have any handling in that? Or is it more that you kind of help reward the right people for doing these things? As in, cause I guess you don't have like power on how taxes work and who gets what. Her Majesty never enters into a political discussion and nor to her representatives. Mm. So we have no political power or interest in changing legislation or regulation. But we can encourage businesses of all sorts to apply for Queen's Awards, which, as I said, are prestigious. The nomination of individuals for their services 
services to the country could include, you know, services to mitigating climate change. Why not? These are the people that we want to recognize. These are the people that are helping Mm. to create a stronger fabric of society. So you say you can't be political, but the things that you were doing that gave you the OBE sort of promotion of minority communities and different ethnicities is sort of a kind of a political debate right now in terms of the whole Black Lives Matter movement and things. So has that been hard to not have an opinion as such on that area? I do have a very strong opinion. The day after the statue of Colston was pulled down from its plinth and dragged through the streets and dumped into the harbour, I wrote a statement from the lieutenancy asking for people to understand what their role can be in addressing matters of this type and asking some questions, you know, why now? Why was that statue pulled down now? Mm. Why was a peaceful demonstration ignored and, and, and not really given the same degree of press coverage? But you think about Bristol. Bristol's an interesting city. Not only is Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant Black, but we have a Black elected mayor. We have a very wide ranging magistracy. The last intake that we had of 30 people, a good 11, 12 of those 30 people had minority characteristics. So it wasn't just age and gender, but it was ethnicity and visibly it was religion as well. So we can do these things if we wish. We have lots of Black professionals. We have organizations that help, again, one of the organizations that that achieve the Promoting Opportunity Queen's Award for Enterprise is working with young Black people and people from disadvantaged communities to help get them into employment. So we're doing a lot of the right things in our city. What we are not doing is doing it quickly enough. And certainly the work that I was doing back in the early 2000s up till I was awarded my OBE was in working with the Prince of Wales, who asked a very interesting question. He said, Peaches, why is it that you are the only minority ethnic owned business that is trading with blue chip companies? And so in that era, I was you know, a a supplier to what was British Steel in those days, to Bowwater Pharmaceutical, where I did their global research on on customer issues. I had some blue chip companies as a very small minority ethnic owned business. So the question was, well, why aren't other people doing it? And that is how I sort of started working with His Royal Highness. And if you look at our achievements in, in, in that time, there are many. And, you know, we've come back to that place Although it's different this time, Sam, I think. And I think it's different because people are willing to call out racial injustice, racial Mm. prejudice, institutional racism in a way that they've never been confident enough to call out Mm. in the past. And I think there are enough people that are willing to do something about it. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful. i believe, yes, we need more energy and urgency behind it. And I'm hoping that on this occasion, we'll, we'll be able to get that. Interesting. So um, yeah, it's clearly something that you've been very good at. As in, I think one of the things that really helps is information and like having these conversations and the term racist itself, it's sort of something that's very loaded with like, it's hard to call someone racist because it's so offensive. Whereas if you can kind of say like, if everyone could admit like, okay, we've been accidentally slightly racist. It's not like, oh my God, I belong in prison right now. It's like, oh, actually, I've just been a bit silly and I didn't notice the things I've been doing wrong. And you're like empowered to be able to like talk about it and do something yourself without feeling sort of really on the spot as such. So I think it makes it easier for people to actually sort of have those conversations about change without feeling under pressure, but not in like such an aggressive way, I guess. It is very sensitive. But I think we've arrived at a point where we have a lot of young, black, educated individuals. If you look at university intakes over the last many years, Mm. you're starting to see more and more people of minority ethnicity coming through. So they are qualified. So some of the questions are, how do you get into employment? How do you progress Mm. up that ladder? And in some cases, you need senior management to recognize talent and promote that talent. Yeah, it's a confusing one because you certainly need to get more diversity in positions of power and starting companies and like all these different things. But it's hard to kind of make it happen without 
forcing it. As in, when you leave things to themselves, it's not like people necessarily discriminating in the other direction, but it's just natural. As in, like I run businesses, but most of the people I know are white guys, and it's not like I'm trying to employ other white guys. But when I'm looking for a co-founder or something, my network is those kinds of people, so it's harder for me to kind of co-found with like other thing, other kind of areas of like ethnicities, even though I'm obviously completely open to these things, but it's just kind of who I know. And that is the challenge. Mm. If you only look for those people that you know, you might be missing some of the better talent out there. Mm. So your question is, how do you expand your network? And how do you expand the places where you look for people or the places that you might advertise for people or all of those types of things that put you in a place that enable you to make better choices because you better believe there is somebody out there that could be the perfect partner for you. Your challenge is to find them. There are lots of ways and means and people and organizations out there that can help you do that. But you've got to be aware enough to say, this is a really important thing and I need somebody different from me to help me do this. It's interesting. If you go back to IBM, when they had their computer, one of the things that they did was they realized they didn't have as many minority ethnic users of their computers as they could do. So they looked for a different retail outlet that is Black-owned businesses that are selling principally to Black communities. Mm. And by establishing a retail supply in that way, of course, they grew their business tremendously. So there are many stories and opportunities out there. Again, like COVID, if you just think about things a little differently, you can have wonderful impacts. Currently, I'm building an app for listening to podcasts at the same time as other people and or like audiobooks. So you can kind of listen in real time together or you can like catch up on the same day or something. So that way you get to share experiences. So if you reach the end of a chapter, you, like your friends reach the end of the chapter, you can actually talk about it. Because I feel like social media, it's just you talking about stuff that you've done. And like, I don't really care about what you've done. I don't really care about telling other people like to show off about what I've done. It's a weird isolating place that it, I don't become friends with other people on social media. Whereas what I like about being social is doing things with people. And I want my phone to let me do things with people. So when I'm listening to podcasts, I, I want to talk about those things further. And I have like these great ideas that I hear, but like it's just me in my own world feeling lonely and I forget it because there's no one to talk about it. So I'm trying to connect people on an experiential level to actually do stuff with each other. So I'm kind of building an app for that. Wow, that's really current and up to date. And when I look at where we are now, COVID means that we're doing a lot more stuff digitally. But you're right, it can be very isolating. So I think that's really exciting. Thanks. Hopefully get to build it and do a good job of it all and it delivers on all the things I want it to do. And so with my business partner, we listen to like a Y Combinator business podcast together. And then we have like a quick call to summarize what we learned from it. And it's just put our heads together so much in terms of like moving forwards. And it's been so useful. And you're like, all people that run a business should do this kind of thing. And then it's just so nice for opportunities to just catch up with my friends. I don't really have a reason to talk to as such. Like the people I did my degree with, they actually got really interesting insights and lives now, but I don't really I can't engage with them on the stuff that they're kind of doing on social media. I don't even go on it that much. And like, I don't really talk about the things that I'm doing there or like, you don't really understand when someone's lonely or what they're actually feeling. Whereas I come like, in a book club with some friends who weren't even that good friends with me before, but they're like my mates mates, but you just sort of get to see what they're up to and like what, what their opinions are of things. And you just have like a normal conversation about the things that you're actually interested in. And it's just been so much more rewarding as like, I just feel like, more connected to people and yeah it's been really nice so far so i'm really hoping it's it kind of delivers on all the things that it's sort of been helping me with at least but for more people is the, is the plan well i think it's great because that's what we need we need many more opportunities to connect with people and to share ideas and to brainstorm and to dream about how we make things better or different and again i think that's one of the things that COVID has taught us you know it's, it's given us a little bit more resilience about having that quiet time and feeling okay, you know, with a quiet time and a reflective time. And then if you can enhance that by having the views of other people as well that have shared a similar bit of your mm. experience, I think it's fabulous. That's the sort of thing that gets a Queen's Award for innovation. Yeah, that's great. 
I'm glad this was recorded. <laughs> no pressure. All right. I'll work on it. Good. Nice. Anyway, so we haven't really covered much of your life as such. What has been interesting in your life and kind of fundamentally shift the way you think and sort of maybe expanded your mindset? I think it all has to do with travel and learning different languages and experiencing life from a different perspective. My youth probably forecast the fact that I would, would move outside of the US. But when I think about the things that really have made me different, it is that curiosity that my parents had when history was being made, we were kind of very close by. So for example, President Kennedy was assassinated. We were one of the many people that lined the streets as that funeral cortege went by. And we were in Washington when Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech. We traveled up to Canada for the World's Fair. We went to Mexico. We did all sorts of things. And this is in the 50s and 60s when doing that as a Black family wasn't always the easiest mm -hmm. thing to do. I was an exchange student in South America. Because my father was a university professor, we had people from all over the world literally coming. So we had the South Koreans. We had people from India. We had people from all over the place. We had an African student that called our house his home while he was studying for his master's and his doctorate degrees. So I had a very international life, which kind of meant I like exploring. I like understanding people. I like seeing things from different perspectives. And I suspect that's done me well. The curiosity is what led you to like your successes and stuff then? I think so. I've never been afraid to try new and different things. And that means learning how to fail because, yeah, you're going to fail sometimes when you do those things. But it also means you learn how to recover quickly and get back on balance and dust yourself down and go again. So mm. that teaches you a bit of tenacity and resilience. Can you give a specific example of one of those perhaps stories of where you kind of learn to fail and pick yourself back up again. When I first lived in South America as an exchange student, you are forced to communicate in someone else's language and you're forced to learn to do things in the way that is normal around there as opposed to normal around where I grew up. There are all sorts of challenges. How naughty could we be when we were in Catholic school? How could we skip lessons? My sister in the family was a smoker and she wanted to go out and have a cigarette. <laughs> so, of course, you get into doing all sorts of different kinds mm. of things. But you learn pretty quickly when you can't pick up the phone and say, Mom, Dad, I got a problem here. Houston, lift me up or bring me back home. I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I wanted to say, beam me up, Scotty. No. But I think I've always been able to negotiate my way out almost on terms that are agreeable to me. Do you have an example of uh, negotiating yourself out of a sticky situation? I landed in a place once where I thought I had a home and a job and I was about 7,000 miles away from parents and I didn't have a home or a job. But I was able to get a job. I was able to find a place to live. I was able to slowly but surely sort things out. Had a cat with me. Cats teach you a lot. They land on their feet. They're aloof when they need to be. <laughs> they rub up against you when they need to. You know, just be more like a cat. I didn't realize you'd been to like, Catholic school. It must have been uh, pretty intense back in the day. Very good character building. I guess there's like a lot of things that like could, you can get away with now in terms of like punishments and stuff, or is it not so bad? I think it was strict, and that's you know there's nothing wrong with strictness. And I think because I was my father's daughter, my father was very well known and very well respected. And so therefore, when I was growing up, I knew don't do anything wrong because parents will find out about it. Nothing gets away. So I learned fairly quickly to be good most of the time. And maybe that's my problem. I still have to be good. Learn to excel. Yes. Learn the rules. Know where the boundaries are. Sail as close to the boundaries as you wish, but on the inside, on the safe side. I had a teacher that sort of taught me like, it's fine to break the rules as long as it doesn't affect anyone. As in like, either way, it kind of <laughs> it made me start breaking more rules. Probably not what he was intending at all. <laughs> to be fair, like some people say things which they don't really mean. My dad once told me like, 
don't bother learning to code, Sam. You'll never get like a good job or paid very well. And I have no idea why he said that or what was going through his brain because he'd forgotten that he said that. But it stopped me from bothering to like learn the code. I was like, I'd been playing with some things at the time when I was like 12 or something. Kind of liked it. So I just didn't bother. Just like computer games for the next like eight years and then got to uni and was like trying to build businesses and was like, oh, if I knew I could code, this would have been so much more useful. And then didn't. And so didn't scale some of the things I was doing. So I was doing like Deliveroo style stuff in Bristol, like two years before Deliveroo was even started. But I was trying to do my degree and I was like running out of lectures, taking calls and doing all this stuff. So I actually had to stop the delivery side of it because it was too busy, but I wasn't able to automate it or build any like the code side of things. I couldn't convince a friend to build it for me because I had like the whole app in my head. And it was just like, oh, well, I'll, I'll just stop this because if my degree will fail, I'll stop. But I would have been like the person that built delivery if it was not for the fact that my dad told me not to learn to code <laughs> when I was a 12 year old. They're not clairvoyant. Exactly. I've got plenty of years left to um, build more ideas. I keep on having them. So that's not a problem for sure. Well, that's wonderful. Keep having ideas. What stimulates you to have ideas? How do you figure out what delivery is, what people need? It's a bit random. So I guess generally comes from things that are kind of annoying me. And I don't really see the world as it is. I see the world as it could be like opportunities for change and stuff. But it's just like, as you're doing things, things that become problems for me, I just sort of naturally interested in how to solve them. And it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just sort of just like solving problems and things. It's kind of annoying sometimes because I, I can't really be that satisfied and happy. I'm always looking to optimize things, which is a bit too much sometimes. So as in, you could be a bit more chilled out about life and just like content as it is, which is like a bit of a yin and yang because it is really good to be happy and chilled and it's really good to change things and make them better and trying to find a way that you can be satisfied in the moment at the same time as like improving it is a confusing one. Life is all about managing those types of tensions and how to keep two opposite ideas going at the same time. It's literally more like a painting of like using black and white together to create what is correct kind of thing. And also like the validation of seeing your ideas happen of other people when you're kind of doing things and you're like i know the world should be doing this but you're not quite convinced enough of it yourself but like after like the amount of consistency of different things that have like come to be it's like okay i definitely have ideas that do become big things i just need to like stick with it and like just make it happen and it will be so it's fine to like realize that ideas are cheap and it's like the execution matters and keep going on things it's a slow thing to learn and Obviously, whenever you're young, you're kind of like, oh, why don't people just give me money now? And like, perhaps I wasn't ready for it when I was younger and stuff. Very interesting. You need to pack around you a whole lot of people. If you're the master thinker, you know, you need to pack around you those people that can do the coding, mm. marketing quicker, Definitely. or it can do the route production quicker, or, you know, all those kind of things. Mm. Yeah. You need a co-op of people around you. <laughs> well, thanks. That's good to hear. Because like I read about like Richard Branson, and you think like, oh, it would be so good if I could just sort of have a team that would just sort of execute on my ideas, and I can kind of like lead on the general kind of ideas side of it. But it, you need to kind of be humble. Actually, I just got to make this happen by myself and do something and like prove that I'm worthy of other people following my ideas first. Because sort of like anyone can have ideas. But yeah, I certainly have that kind of feeling in my head that like something like this should happen in the long run. How about you? Because you've built quite a few businesses and got into like the positions of working with big companies and things and like so what were the answers that you gave to when talking about how you made those things happen you know networks are very interesting things some of my business I got because I understood an industry and regulations and the regulations that applied to them and where some opportunities might be some things I got because I'm very good at listening to what people say and understanding why they are saying what they're saying. And like you with this podcast, trying to collect the evidence that supports why they're saying what they say. So part of it was the ability to do that. And as a scientist, having trained as a scientist, I could write good research reports. But I found consistently people kept dragging me back and saying, how come you're on this supply chain? And how did you do that? And how do we increase diversity in our workplace? And I always keep being pulled back into diversity things. So for example, when Hungary was about to join the European Union, the office of the deputy prime minister asked me to go out to Hungary and work with the government on understanding European social funding and how they could use that to increase women and participation in the workplace, in the economy. So I, I always got dragged back into doing things like that. 
So when the Blair government, for example, started the New Deal for employment, and some of the questions were around how you engage more black people and get black businesses involved. Then again, I got hoiked into doing some consulting and being one of these advisors to the government on things of that nature. So my research and that line of the business always got tugged back to do very practical things about race and gender and disability and all of those things. How do we write the new legislation for this? It's really interesting, but it's annoying to get like stuck in these things, I guess, if you feel like there's other things that you can think about and add to as well. As you say, it's that tension. How do yeah. you provide what it is society is asking you to do? Mm. And how do you manage the things that actually bring you joy and happiness? You know, I was really, reading a biography of Alexander the Great, and it starts with this little, this is really short insight, but it's a, it mentions like, in the 10 years of which he had power, he kind of was like the most successful kind of general, like in the history of the things he did. And like, he was like this really great, like guy, everyone loved him. And he had like loads of ideas and he was like a really brilliant person. It's a pity that like all of his really amazing abilities went into just kind of like war and taking things over. And if he'd lived in a different time, maybe he'd done, done something completely different. And it just kind of makes you think about like, at the moment people put all this time and energy into like building businesses or like, becoming a person of power and things. And like, I wonder what it'll be like in the future that we'll look back on people now and be like, oh, wow, like so the Bill Gates, great guy, did some really cool stuff. But like, if only he'd lived, existed now and did something much more interesting with his time instead of just building some computer company. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's what he's doing now. I think by the way that he pulls philanthropists together and says, you know, let's tackle some of the big issues of our time. You know, let's tackle malaria. And I, I bet he's having fun doing it too. Okay. One thing I like to ask people is, what's one of their earliest memories? My earliest memory is sitting in a wing chair. It must have been around Easter, because I remember an Easter egg sort of thing. And it was a huge, it was absolutely enormous. I was just this little tiny thing. And the floor was about two stories down. <laughs> That's kind of my my earliest memories, sitting in this huge chair. Wow. Is there <laughs> any feelings of, was that feelings of happiness, joy? Like, there must have been something kind of strong going on or it's just really random. I, I, I can't connect it with anything. Like I say, I think it was probably around Easter. Mm. And I think I probably was with my Easter bonnet and my Easter egg and all of those sorts of, of things. But I just remember sitting in this huge, huge chair. What was the neatest thing about North Korea then that you experienced when you were there? Well, I mean, quite literally, it was very neat as a place. There's no like rubbish anywhere. And what's really nice is there's no advertising at all. And you don't notice how much advertising there is in your life just things you listen to on like in the newspapers on sides of buses like the whole time there's people trying to sell you something which means that your life is not as good as it could be if you don't have the thing that they're selling you and they're always cutting you down so your brain is just so much like emptier and quieter because there's nothing telling you that you're not good enough as you are you're just there looking at the world and it's the world and that's that's all it is so that was really nice the people are also quite chilled out and pretty happy because they also haven't got social media or any of these other things to compare themselves to and they just sort of and like when you travel to other places, which may be poor, they kind of know that you're a white person and that like, maybe they can get something out of you. But there was no agenda at all with people in North Korea because you're just more like of an alien and they're just a bit fascinated in you. And so that was also really nice. But it, I mean, certainly it was very interesting to see a state where like, people were more chilled out and maybe what we think of as happiness is not quite attained through the means that we have always. And there are some aspects from the way they live that are actually better. And certainly lots of things that we shouldn't have at all. But yeah, it suddenly opens your mind to like, wait, the way we're running the world isn't necessarily the best way at all. And it was good. I would recommend going for sure. Send me a postcard, eh? Yeah. I've still got a few postcards from when I was there. Yeah. It was, it was a fun place, like for sure. So anyway, what's one of the kindest things someone has done for you? Probably fed me when I was hungry. It, it is those basic things that make us human. You know, I'm thinking about my neighbours at the moment who, because of 
I'm of a particular age. So here um, with COVID, we've been self-isolating and we haven't been out since mid-March. We mm-hmm. started self-isolating isolating before anybody else did. I'm very grateful for my neighbors, for example, that let me piggyback on their grocery deliveries because otherwise we'd be very hungry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think that's just enormously kind, enormously mm. kind. I think that's one of the other benefits we've been talking about COVID is like the neighborliness that it sort of helped generate. And a lot of people got to like know the people around them and like done things for people and just acts of kindness, I think are really cool and really helped develop things as relationships go. So yeah, it's, it's kind of been nice for that. Very nice. So anyway, cool. It's been really lovely to chat to you. I was really fascinated with what you've been up to. Sounds like a Well, the pleasure's mine. Thank you for asking me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Not at all. And yeah, I'll promote some people that I know about for Airbnbs and Queen Awards because they've done some really cool stuff and um, hopefully become someone worthy of getting a <laughs> Queen's Award myself if I keep on trying to do yeah. things. Yeah, cool. hooray. One day. <laughs> it's a good goal to have. Which I think it's very motivating, which is why they do these things. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. My goal for this podcast is to help make people happier and wiser. And I'm also working on a few other projects in the podcasting space to achieve the same thing. I run the Wiser Than Yesterday podcast with a friend where we read and discuss a great non-fiction book a week. Talk about things like philosophy, psychology, the economy, self-improvement and business. Books such as The Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, Invisible Women, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a great resource. Most recently... I've been building an app, Syncify. It's really to level up your podcast experience. You can connect with your friends in the app and listen to the same things. So you can listen live in real time with each other or create shared playlists and catch up at your own pace. You learn so much more by discussing ideas with friends. It's really silly to listen alone. You can also discover and share brilliant episodes with ease without having to try and recommend podcasts in different apps and just it all getting lost and confused. So it's also good for combating isolation and mental health. I personally find social media quite antisocial and I just don't find it easy to reach out to friends to chat for no real reason. But I do love doing things with other people and listening to the same content means that I can actually talk about the same things and it just gives me that friend time without going out of my way. So I really hope that it can help you and I just would love you to try out the beta version and help us build this and obviously do invite your friends. It's all about friends. So you can find out more about Syncify app by going to syncifyapp.com. Thanks for listening. Congratulations on listening to a whole episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. Before you race into another podcast, try pausing. Ask yourself, what have you learned? What could you change? How will you make that change happen? Did you press pause? Knowledge is useless without action. What did you learn? What should you change? And how will you make that change happen? You can tell us what you learned by contacting us through the website, growthmindsetpodcast.com. And feel free to connect with us or our guests, or just peruse the show notes. Our Instagram is at growthmindsetpodcast, or follow me at samjamsnaps for a daily reminder to stop using Instagram. If you enjoy random acts of kindness and want to support the show, you can support us on Patreon or leave us a review on iTunes and you'll make me very happy. And with that, keep learning and keep growing.